I would like to in, let me clarify that in Pakistan, the hatred of Israel and the hatred of Jews is a combined factor. It does not come separately. It has been, it started off with the Middle East crisis because it was well, I mean, Israel hadn't been there before that. But then it has become a combined hatred. The Jews are Israel and Israel is the Jews. And this is across the board in the Muslim community. You very rarely will find someone who will say, you know, I am against the policies of the Israel government, for example. If they would be able to, and it's okay to be against a particular policy. They don't say that. It's always Israel and the Jews. Always together. Yeah, um, I, I want to agree with you. Um, that's been my experience as well. And I, I go to Pakistan every year, and I, um, I have the privilege of teaching. Um, I've, a, a couple of times I've been able to teach at the IIUI, the International Islamic University in Islamabad. More power to you. Oh, yes. I had Do you a, wear your kippah when you go? Uh, yes, when I'm with them. I don't wear it in public, but I wear it when I, when I teach. Because I'm, uh, I'm obviously a Jew. I'm, yes. I'm there because I am a Jew, and this gives me the opportunity to um, actually be out there. The, one of the big problems is that Muslims, in not in the West, never have an opportunity to ever see yes. a Jew. So you can demonize yes. someone you don't see, exactly. you don't know, and so you can yes. you humanize. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, um, I actually had this wonderful class of women, uh, graduate students, in religion, and they were all niqabis. They were all had their faces completely covered and were asking me really smart, very educated questions about Judaism. They had done a f significant amount of studying about Judaism, and it was an opportunity to actually talk to someone. But they, the, their position, and I understand where it's coming from, their position, if you don't know, you, it's very difficult to separate Jews from Israel. Mm -hmm. Because you might say, well, there's Jews, and then there are Zionists or Israelis or what have you. But then what's the logical conclusion? Who is running the Israeli government? Jews. So it must be Jewish motivations. It must be Jewish ideas, mm -hmm. religious ideas, cultural ideas that are causing the, you know, that is creating the kind of political climate that's going on in Israel and the, the tensions and the problems. These are, these are Jews. So... I, I get it. I understand where they're coming from, and I find it very difficult to kind of uh, separate those two positions. Mm -hmm. The land. Uh, so I'm trying to hone in on this. The, the fact of the land, because I've heard speakers recently speak about this, that with the creation of the State of Israel, the, the issue was raised, uh, and it's mentioned in the Quran, and it's mentioned in the... Um, in, in the Torah, who, who owns the land in Palestine, in the Middle East? And historically, I've heard passages from the Quran that say that what a land that is um, that is settled by has to be remain Muslim for, forever. It, it, once the settlement, so Ottomans and Muslims over hundreds of years. So there's a feeling that of, of ownership. And then all of a sudden, a Jewish state comes into being, into this Muslim land. And in the Torah, I've heard there are passages, and you'd be more familiar perhaps, as to the ownership of the land by Jews. So could you sort of speak to that point as to the conflict and ownership of the land? Because that, the, I see that as an underlying factor in the modern you know, um, a turmoil between uh, Jews and Muslims in the Middle East. Um, thank you. Uh, good, good question. Um, I can say as a non-Muslim who wrote a book on jihad in the Quran <laughs> that uh, the Quran does not talk about conquest. It's not part of the vocabulary of the Quran. It's just not there. It talks about fighting, talks about wars, talks about killing. It does not talk about conquest. The Quran refers to Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa, Ha'eretz It's It almost sounds like Hebrew, Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa. These are the same words in Arabic rather than in, in Hebrew. And it does say in the Quran that God told the Israelites to go to the, to the Holy Land. But it doesn't say that 
it's a command of God today that they should go to the Holy Land. It's a reference to ancient history. There's a lot of reference in the Quran to what we would call biblical history. A lot of parallels. Um, it's, it's a different perspective, but it's the same stories. The Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, the crossing of the sea, the receiving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, it's all there in the Quran. So a Jew would read that and say, look, they're, they're, it's a validation of, of Jewish sacred history. And in the Torah, it does say that God promised the land to Abraham and his descendants forever. That's very, very clear in the Torah. Absolutely. It's repeated to the other patriarchs as well. So it's there. Um, also, it also says in later in Nach, it says that God caused the destruction of the temple because of the sins of Israel. And therefore, it's justified. So the dispersion of the Jews and the pushing out of the Jews into exile was something that was caused by God because of their sins. So one can take that argument and say, okay, God did promise the land. It's for their, it's always an inheritance for them forever because it says forever. But then God dispersed the Jews and, and allowed the Babylonians, and we don't have evidence in the, in the Hebrew Bible for the destruction of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 because that's already after the canonization. But the rabbis said it was because of the sins of Jews. So it's, it's a fair argument to say that by Jewish tradition, yes, we own, the, we own the deed to the land, but we couldn't pay the rent, and so we were justified in being kicked out. That's interesting, something to think about. Of course, that's not part of our narrative, because we want to be in possession of the land. We feel a connection there, and so we don't read it that way. Okay. So the Quran does not say that any land that was conquered by Muslims need to, to remain under Muslim control. But post-Quranic literature, it's written by people, it's not God, it's not divine, it's not revelation, does in that legal tradition literature, does make that claim. The, the notion of the division between the Dar al-Harb and the Dar al-Islam, the, the abode of war and the abode of peace, or the, the abode of Islam, which people talk about all the time, as <clears throat> when, when uh, the entire world is an enemy until Islam conquers and then pacifies that world and brings law and brings um, uh, control and, and proper legal traditions, that there's always tension between the Muslim world and the rest of the world that exists in Islamic, some Islamic literature. It's not found in the Quran. And that distinction between the Dar al-Harb and the Dar al-Islam is not found in the Hadith. Not, not even in the Hadith which also has lots of problems, as um, Rahil mentioned, but it's not there. So that's kind of, that's what I call a, 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 an imperialist overlay on the Quranic mm -hmm. template. So the Quran is understood by the Muslims in the Muslim world as a revelation of God that lays out really how to live your life as a good human being. It doesn't say conquest, um, but then conquest is is, is interpreted into the material in order to justify basically the establishment of a, of a Muslim caliphate years after the end of the Quran and the Quran was canonized. I, I hope that makes sense. Right. Um, that, I think you, Rabbi, even used when you were talking about Islamophobia, you even mentioned criticizing some of the belief system of Islam. Um, I was wondering if what you think about conflating both criticism of Islam with bigotry against Muslims, if you think that's useful or not. Um, I think the term um, that you used, uh, Rabbi, was Jewish <coughs> antipathy, or, or antipathy, you know, against Muslims. So I, you're right, there is a difference. I mean, I, I, I said that between the, yes. the, the usage of the term Islamophobia today for political purposes mm -hmm. and anti-Semitism. Uh, Islamophobia is directly to shut up any conversation, whether you criticize Sharia law or you criticize anything to do with Islam or Muslims, it becomes Islamophobia. And it is used as a tool to stop conversation, which is part of the problem that we have. But, you know, it can't be conflated with anti-Semitism because it's two entirely different things. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think uh, I agree with Rahil uh, to the extent that I think in the Muslim world we have a huge crisis because theocracy determines all social and moral issues, uh, at least in the Islamic, political Islamic world. And even people like us, we get called Islamophobes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am an Islamophobe for the radical Muslims. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, and there are times now I reach out to the non-Muslims to say, to really educate them on this word because uh, it has to be stopped and it does not, it should not be given any legitimacy. Would you suggest another word that we could use instead that, that because, that, so that we can protect our, you know, our Muslim sisters and cousins from bigotry, but that, that doesn't contain criticism over a belief system? Well, there is racism and bigotry. It has always been there. It has always existed. And we have to call it racism and mm -hmm. bigotry, okay. which is, mm -hmm. you know, people understand what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is discrimination, there is racism, there is bigotry, depending on the actual incident, and we need to take it instance by instance and deal with it. Mm -hmm. You know, like this, uh, this, I believe there is a man in politics here, and he is being ousted just because he happens to be a Muslim. There's no evidence of him being a radical or of him having, it's just because he's Muslim. Now, that is outright racism, racism and bigotry. Mm -hmm. And I would stand up against mm -hmm. that. But to say that any criticism of, you know, radicals or ISIS or the treatment of women and genuine, sincere issues that we are dealing with, to call them Islamophobia, that's just a way of trying to shut us up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this gentleman added that. Yeah, um, so I wanted to actually um, uh, ask all you three if uh, you guys had any Can you speak up a little bit? Sure. I wanted to ask you guys basically what I was interested about was if you guys, especially in the Muslim world, um, keep up with the Pew Research Center when they do like um, surveys of people and what they believe in, um, just regular people about what Islam thinks about, for example, renouncing Islam or homosexuality. Um, and a lot of times I think when I've read it, it seems like the percentages of people that disagree with that are really high. And I'm wondering if you guys see like a change in that and if that is used to like say, well, that, that's a segment of, of the population that is radical and not like, mo <coughs> excuse me, not moderate. <clears throat> so I'm interested in knowing if that's a good measure of whether the West can, you know, seek out to see where there's moderation in Islam, where there's been improvement in, like, um, just general, uh, uh, you know, people's opinions on these issues. So if you guys could address that, I would appreciate it. There is a 13-minute documentary called By the Numbers, uh, which I would uh, suggest that you look at. It is based on a Pew poll of the Muslim world. It is, I believe, this is about three years ago. It is the latest one that uh, took place. And it talks about uh, the, exactly the thinking, the ideology, what Muslim world, people across the Muslim world. It was uh, done, I think, over uh, perhaps 35 countries. Yeah. Uh, so if you just Google by the numbers and my name with it because I've narrated it, you'll come come across this uh, Pew poll. But yes, in our work we do rely, uh, you know, rely on polls. There hasn't been a current recent poll that has been done objectively, and that's something that we are trying to do because, of course, this is a whole change in course. You know, this this changes all the time in the demographics as well as the thinking depending on where Muslims are coming from. Because in Canada, let's say, they're Muslims from 70, 70 different parts of the world. Uh, they don't think alike. Uh, they're very diverse. So we need to have a poll to see what that thinking is about. Because one of the reasons why I think it's important is because people in the West will point out to that and say, well, even if that small percentage of the population believes yes. that, yes, that's a large number of people yes. that we can call radicals, and it's like, an exactly. impossible fight, you know. Well, yeah, you'll find all that in this by the numbers. Uh, by the numbers. It's okay. very short. It's a 13-minute documentary. Uh, may I quickly add? I mean, notwithstanding what the polls say, 
I firmly believe finally truth is what you experience. So if I were to comment uh, about what's happening in my neighborhood, in my mosques and how they view this issue, uh, I see uh, there is a level of openness. Um, and we take two steps forward and we take t uh, 10 steps back. So I was in Oklahoma. <laughs> Just let's make it only one step. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I mean, so there is a lot of change. Like we have the Muslims who are progressive values openly promoting gay imams and they, uh, they really give a, give a space to, for people uh, who are LGBT to thrive. Then in Canada, there's the mm -hmm. Unity Mosque. And uh, I see a lot of people within the mosques also talking very openly about this. But again, I was in Oklahoma last week, uh, and the Imam began the sermon. He said, the Jews and the Christians are misguided. <laughs> Why? Because the Jews chose Saturday, and the Christians chose Sunday as their holy day, and it should have been Friday. <laughs> so we get caught in this irrelevant buzz. Uh, but if, we, if it is more specific about what you asked about the attitudes towards gays and lesbians, uh, I see a huge shift taking place. Gentlemen in the second row. First of all, uh, thanks so much. I mean, I've been very impressed by you, and I wish that we had more a person like yourself in a Muslim community. Me too. It's exhausting. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I'm very impressed. But I want to tell that the Muslim are very good people. I had the best experience with them. But the problem is when the religious comes to the power, then everything is changed. And then Considering that there is a lot of villages in this Muslim country, and one religious guy goes and tells, oh, you know what? Jews are not good. So it becomes expanded. Yes, you're right. And then my, point, my question is this. What we should do? What, so we know everything that we, that we have a problem. And then, for example, I've been in UCI, University and I and I know that the students in UCI are the highest number of anti-Jews, mm -hmm. but I never felt it when I did go to university mm -hmm. to UCI doing my residency. So what we should do? My question is this: Well, we can talk and talk and talk, but we have to do expand this kind of the yes. uh, meeting to the younger community and mix this is, all this of is, them. Um, this That's is what, what I want from right. Rob. We are doing this. And I'm sure you're speaking at colleges and university when groups and young people. Yes. Yeah? Yes. So, you know, uh, more organizations have to take on this mandate. In my organization, which is called the Councils for, Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow, we believe that as Muslims, it is very important for us to take up the causes of anti-Semitism and <laughs> persecution of other minorities as well. So we take up the cause of the Zidis. We've had a very, very strong lobby in Canada against the theocracy in Iran, against the treatment of minorities and Baha'is in Iran. So regardless of you know who, what the issue is, it behoves us to take up those issues, just as we would expect our Jewish and Christian friends to support us when there is racism against our community. And it has been happening. Uh, you know, when there was a synagogue that was attacked, it was the Muslims who stood around it, protecting it in a ring. So there needs to be more of this, and we need to take our message together, together, uh, not alone, together, as Jews and Muslims, as Christians and Jews and Muslims, into universities, into campuses. But it's very hard to get the government to fund something like this. Uh, you know, it, it needs to be done as at a national level. So my. Always my advice is lobby your politicians, uh, lobby the people that you vote for, your local communities, and if you can't do that, do it yourself. You know, uh, start going into places. We are very actively doing this in Canada. Soraya is involved in her uh, part of the world. Connect if you want to reach out. Connect with these people and do it. Final question. No, there is, this gentleman has had his hand up for 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just I wanted to ask him. Um, everybody is so eloquent and so mm -hmm. unbelievably correct <laughs> in both positions. And, I, and so the question I have is, at what point, almost like a father, 
does a leader or leaders just tell the children to grow up? <laughs> and, and we've seen how individuals, the power of the word, the power of an individual, we see it even today, we see it Can throughout you speak history. Up a little, please? Uh, I, do you not think that leadership, in addition to all this education and dialogue that you are very correctly promoting, that leadership is really the key to getting something moving in the yes, right direction? Yes, absolutely yes. Leadership is the key. We need to train our leaders, we need to train our youth, we need to, uh, we need to do so much more. But this is a start. May I, I, I want to Please. piggyback on this comment. We need to microphones. We need to call people out when they are doing the wrong thing. Jews should not be calling Muslims out when they do the wrong thing. We should help our Muslim neighbors and colleagues call Muslims out when they do the wrong thing. But we need to call Jews out when they do the wrong thing. And that's, that's effective. And we, we cannot stop doing that. We have to, and if we haven't done it, if you haven't done it yet, start doing it. That means writing letters to the Jewish Journal. That means uh, you know, writing letters to the editor. That means um, speaking to people. You, know, in, in a, in a, you can do it in a positive way, too. You don't have to just be chastising. But what are you referring to as the wrong thing, when Jews are doing the wrong thing? When, when you hear or you read someone making a remark uh, that is anti-Islamic, that's we would call it Islamophobic or, or racist. Uh, racist against Muslims in general, you don't let that slide. I mean, this is, the, this is the position of the ADL. You do not allow anyone to make an anti-Semitic statement in public without calling the person on it. Otherwise, if you don't, you're, you're, you're acknowledging that it's fine, that that's the truth. And we are also guilty of making these kinds of mistakes and allowing them to slide, and we shouldn't let it happen. And, and also, uh, picking up from where you stop, the, the, the huge problem in the world is that 50% of the people are not talking. Uh, so standing up for each other, speaking out, and leadership sometimes can be overrated. We don't need formal appointed leaders, but we are, all of us here, we are leaders. I think if we can reach out to one person, uh, that's, that's leadership also. Final question. I have, I have a couple. Sorry. Um, I'd like to know when Muhammad went into Medina, was that a peaceful uh, situation or was there a massacre? When Muhammad went into Medina, so there, there are different historical versions of this, but when Muhammad went into Medina, it was peaceful. And in fact, he came to Medina as a facilitator and a peacemaker for the minority communities that live there. And he gave, gave them open permission to practice the faith they want the way they wanted. They were Christians, Jews, Sabians, non-believers. The only thing that he was against was idol worship, because he had been sent to spread the message of monotheism. And he took a pact from the tribes, the Jewish tribes and the Christian tribes, all of them who were there, that they would not have to fight the wars with the Muslims, but uh, in return for that they would pay what is jizya, what is a tax, instead of having to fight their wars for them. But they um, had freedom to follow and practice their faith. The story of the massacre is not in the Quran. There is reference about this particular tribe that betrayed uh, Muhammad and his followers, which meant that they had made a pact that they would not betray the Medinan Muslims against the Meccans who were at war with them. But they did. They went and joined the Meccans. So it was a question of life or death. Now, when we look at the state of Israel that fights in self-defense, it is justified because they are fighting in self-defense for life or death. That is exactly what Muhammad was doing fighting in self-defense. And in that process, there were people that were killed. I have a couple more questions. I understood that the Muslim Brotherhood created the term. Yes, the um, Also, my little knowledge of the Quran and my heavy reliance of the travel on Sharia, 
It says you don't question the Quran. That you're not allowed to question anything. Jews question every letter backwards and forwards and 20 times around. But if, if I recall correctly, you're not supposed to question because it's the perfect word of God. And Let me just take it one at a time. First of all, please do not ever conflate the reliance of the traveler or the hadith with the Quran. Please do not compare the reliance of the traveler or the hadith or any of these other literatures so with the. Law on the basis of law. No, the reliance of the tra traveler is a Muslim Brotherhood book, and it is not something that majority of Muslims follow. So you know, and the hadith we just mentioned are fabricated, so they are not followed by majority. Well, they are by a large percentage of Muslims, but then that is the reliance of the traveler, with the, which is the Muslim brother, which has nothing to do with the Quran. Uh, the, the, the Quran is considered to be the divine word of God, but it has a human interpretation. And that human interpretation is very much open for questioning, and it has been. Uh, there are, the, the, sorry, ishtihad, yes, the concept of ishtihad. Uh, you know, of reason and logic is there. The re this is why we have so many different interpretations of the Quran, because the understanding and the meaning of it is a human interpretation, and it is definitely open. The fundamentalists, the extremists, the um, radicals will tell you that it is not open for question, because that is what they want to follow. So the Salafis, uh, which is the Saudis. Their Wahhabi ideology was that this is the only way you can understand Islam and there's no other way and if you don't follow it this way you're a heretic and therefore you should be killed. So for them, Shias, Sufis, there are 72 sects in Islam. They wouldn't be there if there wasn't diversity. There are four schools of judicial thought, five if you count Shiism, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Jafri school of thought. They have existed since day one. That's where they separated, but the jurisdiction, the, the, the judicial schools of thought from day one were four, and that was totally acceptable. Even more. Even, yes. They're, they're now narrowed to four, yes. but there were, there were many more schools of thought. If you, you walk into a Jewish library and you see a bunch of commentaries on the Torah, right? Mikrot Kudolot, you find Rashi, Ibn Ezra, all kinds of you, so Hasidic commentaries. If you walk into a Muslim library, you'll find many, many, many more commentaries on the Quran. So the, the, this is a narrative that you cannot question. That's a narrative that was, as, as Rahel mentioned, was put forth by these kind of fundamentalist, more modern perspectives. I have been to a couple of talks at the Islamic Center, and it just isn't a Q&A about the I think Rosh Boulevard Temple some years ago had a question of violence and religion. They had a minister, a priest, a rabbi, and somebody from the Islamic Center. And I asked the person representing the Islamic Center, I had two questions. Why did the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem support Hitler during the war again, and help to kill the Jews? And why, after 9-11, weren't the good Muslims out in the streets saying this was not done in the name of Allah? Mm -hmm. So the first question, and the title of the talk was, last question, was, you know, uh, violence and religion. He didn't want to talk about what happened 60 years ago. And to the second question, he said, I don't have to show my patriotism that way. And he answered neither question. And that's yeah. common. It happens. It's a way of deflecting from the real issues. But this is why we're It's interesting because the topic of evil yes. is violence and religion. Oh. Right. Yeah, and, and this Takiya is why we're is not also, having the real conversations. But the, the, the Takiya is in the Quran if I'm not mistaken. No, it is. <laughs> the, the, and this is so unfortunate that I had not even heard of the word Takiya until I came to the West. And now it's so people. No, it is, the, it is a <coughs> concept which was primarily among the Shia faith of if your life is in danger, you can lie and say that. It, let's say you are, you, there's a knife to your throat and they're saying, are you a Muslim or not? And they're going to kill you. If you say you're Muslim, you can say that you're not. It is under condition of life and death. It's not something that you use a normal every day. It's, it's, the Muslims it's the, follow the commandments of do not lie. The, the equivalent is Moranism. Jews did exactly the same thing in Spain. 
Yeah. You pretend you're a Christian, but you're really a Jew. Right. That's, that's the meaning of taqiyya. Exactly. But what happens is that when we speak, we are, the first time somebody said, oh, you are doing taqiyya. And I said, excuse me, in my language, Urdu, taqiyya means pillow. I have no idea what you're saying. You know, I sleep on a taqiyya. One, one last thing about this issue. This is, unfortunately, a typical move. The, the taqiyya refers to what Rahil just said and what I said about Marano. You, when your life is in danger, you are allowed to lie about your status in order to survive. And somebody says, oh, you Muslims are allowed to lie, right? So I can't trust you because you're not going to tell me the truth about Islam because you're practicing taqiyya, which is something that you should be, which is not at all what it means. It doesn't mean that at all. It's a little, it's a little bit like saying, well, there's a Jewish kebab to control the world. You Jews control all the banks. And then you say, no, that's not true. I don't know anything about Jews controlling all the banks. It's not true. And then the answer then is, well, that's because you're not high enough in the hierarchy to know the truth. Or you're lying, one or the other. These are arguments that you cannot respond to in any kind of a rational, responsive, responsible way. These are accusations, and, and they're, it's, it's really nasty. So, that's the so, problem with Takia. So I want to thank. We are having so much fun. Yeah, <laughs> we are having fun, and people I are. I need my Takia. And, and, and people are welcome to stay and have more fun. Uh, but I want to close the formal formal session. Uh, I, I, uh, thank you, Soraya, for participating, and, and Rachel and Ravain for really the, the, the calm and, and uh, wonderful uh, description. Uh, on this subject matter, and if I if I have only one thing to take away from it, I'll only take one away. That is that each of us has to be responsible for calling out people uh, when they behave and speak in an improper manner. Uh, and if we do that in little ways, we can make this world a better place and combat anti-Semitism and combat Islamophobia. So I mean, thank you for bringing. Um, I don't actually.